This is History 72A, Winter Quarter 2024, and I am your host, Karen. This image is here to remind me, to warn you, that there are a number of disturbing images in this lecture video. I have tried to avoid the most gratuitously violent images, and with the ones I do use, only where I think they add a dimension to understanding, but they are there, including the next slide. Early on, I included race among the examples of socially constructed categories. We have seen how the English colonists to North America, particularly in the Chesapeake region, deliberately constructed race in terms of ancestry, specifically to create a self-reproducing labor force. Only the most sociopathic would be okay with something like this coffle here on the slide, and worse, without a surrounding social structure to make the treatment of one group seem normal. And that is done by constructing a category to divide people. This is the case with the construction of the category of race that the United States retained and enlarged upon from the English North American colonial system. This construction of race is supposedly based on some aspect or suite of aspects that vary in consistent ways in humans. The English colonists in North America who pushed through laws codifying racialized chattel slavery deliberately tried to build a distinction based on ancestry and then justify it with a system of linked binaries. Images like this one help to create those categories. The enslavers are depicted with extremely pale sort of apricot colored skin. The enslaved are all depicted as having very dark skin. Notice also that the enslavers are clothed and that the enslaved are unclothed. This is the English Chesapeake construction of race. Ultimately, the only thing that mattered to people writing laws in the 17th century Chesapeake, and these were all white men writing laws, the only thing that mattered was some degree of African ancestry. Everything else was there for justification. You have seen the English obsession with a particular idea of purity in both lecture and the brown reading you had from the book Foul Bodies. You also learned that the English considered themselves perfectly pure, but that they constantly worried that they would lose that justification for superiority. The system on the slide created in the Chesapeake makes the linked binaries European ancestry, African ancestry, white, black, straight hair, closely curling hair, civilized, savage or barbaric, clothed, naked, superior, inferior. Notice that in this system, the assumption of the European colonists was that European ancestry could be corrupted or made impure by crossing columns, but not the other way around. Power for an individual could be decreased based on this type of system. It cannot be increased except in exceedingly small amounts and never up into the top ranks. Higher status people could lose status and end up closer to the second column, but no one from the second column could entirely subtract their supposed impurity to get all the way over to the first column. Purely English people could only come from, supposedly, supposedly, mind you, reality is often not the point here, endless generations of purely English people. The binaries at the bottom here, superior, inferior, are clearly false. In order to make the whole system work, these binary associations at the top, European ancestry, African ancestry, would have to be naturalized. And the characteristics in each column linked to one another. 
It is the same idea as the male superior trousers, female inferior skirt set of binaries. Even in today's culture with far more activism and awareness regarding sex gender than the world of my childhood, we still understand the power dynamic in male-female sets of binaries. There are large sections of the U.S., some of them quite close to me here, in which a man would never wear a skirt because skirts are associated with women and women are less than. I'm stressing ancestry here rather than skin color. Although the English put skin color near the top of the set of linked binaries, actual skin color was not what the forming system of race inequality was based on. The photo above on the slide here was taken in England. There's no question when the mother and father meet others that they are English. These children here, they are classified as white. You've seen the lower picture in a previous lecture. Both of these children were considered black and enslaved when the photo was taken. Phenotype or appearance is not the most important issue here. You may be wondering whether English plus English but born in North America, was put in the top category or below it. And the answer for the 18th century, the 1700s, from the perspective of England, is below. To the English, people born in North America to English parents were close to the top category, but not actually in the top category. Before we go on, I want to go back to one of the first lectures and the Vance article on social construction theory. These will be in the key points for this lecture. I would rather have you listen now and write them down later. Social construction theory does not argue that the English colonial way of constructing race in North America is not real. It was very real to the two children in the bottom photograph on the previous slide, and the effects are still very, very real in American society now. Social construction theory says that this way of constructing race was not inevitable. People with power made choices. Some of the children in the two photos in the last slide are not better than the other children because of their ancestry or the melanin in their skin, but only one of the sets of children was enslaved. That was how race formation worked east of the Mississippi in the Anglophone or English-speaking colonies. But all of North America is not and was not east of the Mississippi, and all European colonists were not English. This on the slide that you are looking at is a Costa painting. You will see this or something like it again later in the lecture. This was used to reflect the way that race began to be formed in Spanish America. And you can, I hope, see that there is not just a binary. There are lots of of rectangles with pictures. We can zoom in on some so that you get a better idea of what is being depicted here. The Spanish created an incredibly intricate system of racial hierarchy. The box on the left here shows a man who has one black parent and one white parent, and it labels him mulatto. It also indicates that the woman is from Spain. If these two have a child together, that child would be classed as Morisco. In the next box over, if a Morisco married a Spaniard, the child would be a Chino. And if a Chino married a Native American, and so on, and so on, and so on. None of these terms, Morisco, China, Lobo, corresponds to any other traits. But these terms were assigned to real people and made a real difference in their very real lives. Those categories are real in the sense that all of these children would be assigned to one or another, and that would make a material difference in the lives and choices of these children. I give you all quotes periodically because they say quite concisely what I am explaining in a lecture. 
concisely, but not necessarily always immediately clear to everyone. For the moment, I am going to read the quote on this slide and the next. Think about what Martinez's words mean to you, both now and going through the lecture. The shifting meanings and uses of race simultaneously underscore its social constructedness and suggest that there is no single trans-historical racism, but rather different types of racisms, each produced by specific social and historical conditions. The historian's task is precisely to excavate its valences within particular cultural and temporal contexts, study the processes that enable its reproduction, and analyze how it rearticulates or is reconstructed as social regimes change and histories unfold. This is the first lecture in Module D. The title here, Away from the English, West of the Mississippi River, is terrible because it defines half a continent of people merely as being not English and says nothing else about them. Creating a better title for Module D and explaining why it is better and how it will be useful for a person just walking into the class would make a great quiz response question. Hmm. It would probably be a good idea to read the titles of all of the lectures on the syllabus under Module D. You have a brief introduction to Costa paintings, and I am hoping you have been thinking about how race is basically defined through reproduction. You have seen and will see that controlling both the meaning and structure of what counts as family is fundamental to constructions of race. I went back to England to help situate the power structures that emerged in English colonies in a bigger historical arc, so that what happened on the ground in North America makes a little more sense. In this lecture and the next, we are going to take a look at what happened in Spanish America from Columbus through the early modern period. In this lecture, we will consider the context in Spain and in the next, the particular context that formed where Spain colonized North America. We are starting off here with Spain and the idea of limpieza de sangre or purity of blood. As always, I ask people to forgive my bad pronunciation of any language, including English. I have been suggesting that times of extreme stress tend to pit people against one another. I am not saying that stress alone makes people do horrible things, but that when everything is horrible, people try to feel that they have some control. Our story in Spain starts all the way back in the 1300s, still in the Middle Ages. I'm not going to go into any detail on economy, but in this period, Europe was transforming to a money economy, and that came with certain stresses and disasters. The early 14th century saw extended famine in Europe, and then the plague or the Black Death hit Western Europe, including Spain, in waves through the 14th century. Spain experienced two particularly devastating waves of bubonic plague, one beginning in 1347 and the other in 1388. Each plague wave would wipe out about half of the population, sometimes more. On top of all of those disasters and possibly related to the sense of helplessness that came with them, across Europe, Jewish communities experienced periods of particularly virulent anti-Semitism. On a regular basis, European Jews experienced many restrictions in where they could live, what work they could do, whom they could marry, and how they could dress. In 1391, an extremely violent series of anti-Semitic attacks occurred across the Iberian Peninsula, killing thousands of Jewish people. In the wake of these events, tens of thousands of Jews converted en masse to Christianity in the late 14th century, while others left Europe for uncertain futures elsewhere. 
From the beginning of the 15th century, Catholic missionaries, including the Franciscans whom we met earlier in this class, but later in historical time, proselytized heavily in Jewish communities. For Spanish Christians, the mass conversion of Jews was both a success and the source of anxiety. The original Spanish Christians increasingly worried that the conversos, or recently converted Jews, were insincere and secretly still practiced Judaism. More than this, the so-called old Christians decided that Jewishness was transmitted in the blood through generations. And because in this system, Jewish was the disempowered group, any Jewish ancestry, even in families that had converted to Christianity a century before, became considered a source of weakening true Christianity. In other words, any Jewish ancestry became a source of pollution. As time went on, conversos, or new Christians and Jews alike, experienced violence from old Christians. Beginning in the mid-15th century, the 1400s, cities in what is now Spain made laws limiting the lives of new Christians. Toledo seems to be the first city to do this, and in 1449 passed a decree that made converted Jews and their descendants permanently ineligible for public offices and all municipal appointments. Cities that passed these laws argued that, quote, clean, beautiful, old Christians must protect the Catholic faith by making certain that only individuals with unsullied Christian lineages could occupy positions of power. This did not actually go over well with all Catholics, both inside and outside of Spain. The Catholic Church was meant to be unified and baptism to be redemptive. The laws against new Christians undermined both of those principles. The image on the slide here shows food because old Christians sought to control dietary restrictions in conversos or new Christians. Along with the other controls over conversos and Jews, new Christians were required to give up any contact with Jewish family and community. The reasoning was that even the slightest contact with a Jew would corrupt a Christian. I want to point out now that breaking up community ties and especially family structure is something that we have seen before and will see again in this course. New Christians were not permitted, in law, practice is another thing, not permitted to have contact with Jews who might corrupt them. But new Christians were also not allowed to have contact with old Christians, lest the old Christians be polluted. Recall from the beginning of this lecture that purity is not resistant to any level of pollution at all. This is effective for keeping power in the hands of a quite limited group. In Spain, people who were discovered to have any Jewish ancestry were removed from religious orders, no matter how obvious their sincere commitment to Catholicism might be. In 1478, the Pope granted Castile, remember that we are not quite to a unified Spain yet in 1478, the Pope granted Castile permission to found its own inquisition. An inquisition was a tribunal, or three people acting as judges, set up to investigate charges of heresy among Christians, particularly conversos and new Christians. At this point, the goal of the Inquisition was not to identify Jews who were already marked by clothing and living restrictions, but to root out supposed crypto-Jews acting as Christians who might Judaize the Catholic Church from within. Recall that Spain was also involved in fighting the Reconquista to claim, supposedly to reclaim, the Iberian Peninsula for Catholics from Muslims. In 1492, a unified Aragon and Castile under Isabella and Ferdinand symbolically completed the Reconquista by taking over Granada. This boosted the prestige of the Spanish monarchy and linked it firmly to Catholicism. 
Remember, this period at the end of the 15th century also marks the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in the rest of Europe. In 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella oversaw the symbolic end of the Reconquista, funded Columbus on his rather unpromising voyage, and issued the decree of 31 March 1492, which ordered Spanish Jews to leave the region that had been their home since the first century CE. The decree also included most Muslims and in another 10 years expelled all Muslims. The Spanish Inquisition, what Americans generally think of as the Inquisition, extended through the unified Spain. There are historical debates about the degree of actual violence imposed by the full Spanish Inquisition as opposed to earlier regional inquisitions. Certainly, Protestant reformists amplified each instance of violence in order to make Catholicism appear distinctly barbaric. I am not going to wade into that debate. The violence and the threat of violence were enough to terrorize people. Many left the Iberian Peninsula, and those who wanted to stay in Spain became extremely anxious to prove their Catholicism as well as the purity of their family line. Notice that both lineage and religious affiliation had become ways of ranking people, ways of determining who was to be included and who was to be excluded, and that the line between religion and heredity was becoming more and more blurred. Everyone subject to Spanish law, spiritual or temporal, meaning religious and secular, everyone was anxious to prove that their blood was pure. Blood symbolized heredity here. So everyone in Spain was necessarily concerned, whether they wanted to be or not, with purity of blood or limpieza de sangre. I am going to try to tread on as few historian toes as possible here. I specialize in American history and in gender and sexuality, not in Europe and not in religious history. There are historians who see the fixation on limpieza de sangre as early racial thinking, and there are historians who consider it extremely important to maintain a distinction between race and limpieza de sangre. I am going to split the difference a bit and say that limpieza de sangre is neither exactly like race nor entirely different. Limpieza de sangre had elements that would show up in later racial constructions. It rested on ideas of differential human value, it fixated on purity, and people looked for pollution in heredity and parentage. Limpieza de sangre was a mindset that morphed over both time and space. Beginning on the Iberian Peninsula and then traveling to North America with the Spanish conquest, Limpieza de sangre is not the same as race, but it set up a framework of thinking that would be compatible with particular ways of constructing race. I will spare you all of the details, but try to summarize what happened in Spain from this point. Statutes of limpieza de sangre were established not just at the national level, but often at the community level. These statutes required a person to positively prove their limpieza de sangre to get access to most learned professions, to join military orders, or to hold a position in government or the church. Lutheranism, the initial split of the Protestant Reformation, established footholds in parts of Spain, and these limpieza statutes were applied to Protestants as well as Jews and Muslims. Protestants, Jews, and Muslims were all heretics, from the perspective of the Catholic Church. But this heresy was heritable. It was a pollution of an entire family line. I am going to quickly remind you of the medieval and Renaissance construction of the human body that rested on levels of the four humors and on relative heat. Remember that blood was transformed into semen. 
and that men had more heat, not higher temperatures, but metaphysical heat, hence the external genitalia. Both men and women produced seed necessary for reproduction, but male seed had more heat and was stronger. This could affect limpieza de sangre. If people did insist on marrying across caste and reproducing, the man should be of higher status. His seed would last in the blood for more generations. Noble male seed could cleanse some pollution from female seed, especially if there were repeated injections of noble male seed into a bloodline across generations. This meant that lineage of both male and female forebears had to be presented for at least three generations to prove limpieza de sangre. This purity and grades of pollution were linked not to an individual's own religion, but to that of their great-grandparents. This view of society went with Spanish colonists to New Spain, which presented types of variability and issues with purity that were not directly addressed by the systems and practices of Spain. Limpieza de sangre, purity, impurity, and rasa. I'm glossing over this quickly, but rasa would morph into race. At this stage in our story, the term was used to discuss members of the Jewish race or members of the Muslim race. All of these categories that were socially constructed in their beginnings had extremely fluid requirements and definitions, but they were all decidedly real in Spanish society, politics, and economics. They had decidedly real consequences when it came to marriage, reproduction, and family formation in Spain. And once the Spanish colonized the Americas, to marriage, reproduction, and family formation of everyone touched by Spain. I have been saying that people had to prove limpieza de sangre to have access to certain jobs, living spaces, and other features related to power. How did a person do that? I'm going to simplify, but the process will be close enough for our needs. The person who wanted a post, title, office, etc. applied to the local tribunal. At that time, the petitioner submitted as much genealogical information as possible and sometimes information that was not possible. This was called by longer names, but they all begin with the single word, information, and many historians abbreviate the name of information required in these petitions. Information, each form, that's a form that you fill out, had to include names and places of origin of parents and for grandparents, as well as what each individual had considered their permanent address. This documentation allowed for written and oral verification by authorities. This would facilitate verification through appropriate registers, birth, death, marriage, as well as access to individuals in a community who could vouch for the petitioner's lineage verbally. In other words, usually older individuals who might remember a grandparent or great-grandparent of the petitioner. People chosen by the tribunal as investigators would actually go out and talk to people in these towns. If a petitioner were married, all of this had to be supplied for their spouse as well. Once the tribunal received all of the required information from the petitioner, they chose a commissioner to conduct an investigation. If the petitioner were determined to be impure, the tribunal just never got back to them. If the petitioner were judged to be pure, the tribunal gave them several written copies of a certificate verifying purity of blood. The certificate was a probanza. Again, I'm shortening the name in accord with other historians. This was a system built to accumulate misinformation over time, and not just at the moment when the probanza was granted or not granted. Gaming the system means using the rules and procedures meant to protect a system to instead manipulate the system 
for a desired outcome. In this case, investigation could be an incredibly long, drawn-out process. Absence of information could be interpreted in different ways. Any step of the process could be gamed in either direction. For example, records could be forged, testimony could be bought, or the entire Provenza could just be bought, or the commissioner could be a personal friend or enemy. Successfully forged records stayed in the archives, as did all of the information and investigation results. This created a version of history shaped by hegemonic ideas, but not necessarily true to those hegemonic ideas. In theory, Provenzas reflected lineage, blood, and religious faith. In reality, they were affected by money, especially in a growing mercantile world, as well as by favors, friendships, and enmities. This takes us through the 1500s, and this is the system used to vet, meaning to verify and choose, the Spaniards awarded government or religious posts in New Spain as Spanish colonization expanded on the American continents. We will examine how ideas of limpieza de sangre influenced colonization and adapted to a new reality in the next lecture. Key points for lecture 13. Race is a socially constructed category, and it reflects power structures. Categories and bins reflect the distribution of power rather than an essential meaning of some aspect of physical reality. This means that the categories are not stable across time and space. Social construction theory does not absolutely does not say that constructed categories like race and gender sex are not real. Once they have been woven into power structures by one or more societies, they are completely real and inescapable. Social construction theory says that the systems of sorting and categories were not inevitable. Melanin and genitals vary from individual to individual. There is no innate reason that those traits should be used to divide up people, much less to sort people into a binary and assign one group greater value. Late medieval through Renaissance Spain created linked categories of religion and blood. In order to gain a position with any power, a person had to prove that their blood was pure, without religious stain for generations. The petitioner would have to prove their limpieza de sangre. Spain used a system of investigation and certification. People judged to be pure by the investigation into their parentage and lineage were issued a certificate of purity or probanza. The certification system was vulnerable to cheating. People could and did game the system, literally rewriting history in the process. The ideas of limpieza de sangre and a certification system based on examining a person's parentage and lineage traveled to the Americas with Spanish colonists. These are more Costa paintings, not from the group I showed at the beginning of this lecture. We will cover Costa paintings in part two of this lecture. Each one conveys a huge amount of information, including on clothing, although we have to be careful about distinguishing reality from stereotypes. Costa paintings were intended to represent a harmful social construction, and some artists emphasized that to leave no doubt. But the pictures by other artists are also often enthralling in their own right. I've put more of these in the next couple of slides. This pair of images shows Spanish colonial fears of latent or lasting impurity. The child of a Spanish man and a Morisco woman was classified as albino. This is linked to the name of a condition resulting in lack of melanin only in the fact that the word literally means white. For all appearances, this child is white. 
But the albina was a source of concern to Spanish colonists because she carried hidden impurity in her blood, poisoning the lineage of Spanish men. The albina was pretty much always shown as blonde. In this pair of pictures, on the left, the Spaniard is given all the trappings of elite status of the time, velvet clothing, the wig with the queue and the hat. His wife and child look at him, although his gaze is not shown, and the child looks absolutely worshipful. The man on the right is shown in lower status clothing, although he is also Spanish. Interestingly, the woman's gaze in both pictures is nearly identical. She is looking at the man, but her expression is somewhere in the doubtful or amused range. The child on the right looks up to their mother and not their father. Keep these patterns in mind when we pick up with Costa paintings in the next lecture.